Hey, and welcome back. So anybody who knows me from the videos that I post here or just from real life knows that I've been obsessed for a long time with interesting or weird or obscure devices and gadgets, odd computers, retro tech, um, particularly odd or uh, evolutionary dead end type devices. I'm always fascinated by what worked and maybe in some ways more importantly, what didn't work in the real world. And I can kind of trace my interest in this stuff in a way to a, a very particular moment in time. I was a kid in the early 90s, and the early 90s in particular, in the late 80s, were a, a very interesting time for technology. Today, I'm recording this in 2018, and today for personal computing, technology has really kind of cemented itself into a, a two by two quadrant. For computing on a desktop, you've got Mac OS and Windows, and in your pocket, you've probably got an iPhone, iOS device, or an Android device. And of course, there are some fringe players out there. I'll probably get at least a few comments from Linux people, but in broad terms, if you look at the general user population of the world, you're a Mac person, a Windows person, an iPhone person, or an Android person. And that's fine. But what I really kind of miss about the early 90s is that it was a wide open space. It was a completely uncemented landscape for technology in, in the consumer space. And it's kind of the wild, wild west. You had all kinds of companies, both very large and established and also little tiny startups bringing up everywhere. And everybody thought they had the next big thing. Everybody thought they had the right idea that was gonna catch fire and change the world. And so you ended up with thousands of products being released and only a few of them ever making much of a dent on the planet. And for me as a kid in those days, I didn't come from a family with much money. I was desperate to get my hands on any technology I could. And so a lot of my early exposure to computers and technology were on the retail displays at various uh, electronic stores around San Francisco. And one in particular stood out. There was a, an electronics like uh, home theater, computer kind of mashup store that was on Market Street in San Francisco. It doesn't exist anymore, I don't know what they're now, but in any case, at that point, there was the store and they were very forgiving for, of, of me, just kind of lurking in their store, spending time looking at their display units and trying things out and asking questions. I'm sure I asked them a, a, a billion questions, but uh, they were very kind and gave me a lot of time and attention. And for a little while, they had a display of what was one of the most influential, if not successful, uh, early portable computing products around, and that was the Apple Newton, which I have an example of here. And the Newton, this is a, a la late model Newton. This is a Newton 2100, which was the last version of the Newton that came out. But in the days that I was first exposed to it, it would have been the predecessor to this, the Newton message pad. But in any case, the Newton was a pretty big deal when it came out, and people are uh, still apt to make jokes about it. It ends up kind of being viewed as a flop in retrospect, but at the time it was pretty influential. And it really kicked off this entire market of what became known as PDAs, or Personal Digital Assistants. Semi-pocket-sized, <laughs> this stretches the definition of pocket-sized, but roll with me here. Pocket-sized computers that you could use to keep track of your daily life. Um, calendars, appointment books, contacts, taking notes, um, things like that. And so the Newton was an early example of that stuff. And that market or that product family kind of exploded when Palm entered the market with the Palm Pilot and all of the subsequent spinoffs and so on. So one of my early exposures to all of this was playing with a Newton display in that store on Market Street, but they didn't have that display for very long. And weirdly enough, they swapped it out for a different display unit that I ended up spending a lot more time with because I, as far as I knew, I was the only person in San Francisco who cared about the gadget they put on display. And that gadget was this, the Sony Magic Link. And this is what I'm gonna talk about today. I'll definitely do a video about the Newton another time, but today I wanna to talk about the Sony Magic Link. So I'm gonna switch camera angles so you can see a little bit more about what this device is and really even though it's almost entirely forgotten why it holds a very interesting and very relevant place in computer history in ways that are still echoing today in 2018 and onward so stick around i think you're going to enjoy a close-up look at the sony magic link 
This, my friends, is the Sony Magic Link. It's about the size and shape of a hardback book, although it comes in this sort of quasi-leatherette soft-touch case, which I'm gonna open up in a moment. But before I do that, I wanna actually talk about something kinda of interesting. Before we even look at the device, I think a little bit of context about why this thing is so interesting will be helpful. And I'm not gonna go super deep into any of this. There's a ton of information you can find online. Certainly Wikipedia is a good place to start if you're interested in this. But I think a little bit of context is helpful because otherwise this just seems like another device that nobody's ever heard of. What's the big deal? But the origins of this thing, and more particularly, the origins of the operating system that it runs, which is called Magic Cap, and you're gonna see that in a minute, uh, are pretty fascinating. So Magic Cap was an operating system developed by a company called General Magic. But General Magic was not just your run-of-the-mill startup. General Magic actually began within Apple Computer in the late 1980s. And General Magic effectively was started by two guys whose names you may or may not know, Bill Atkinson and Andy Hertzfeld. And these two guys, if you don't know their names, you really should, because they are two guys who are directly responsible for the creation of the Macintosh and, by extension, for the creation of the modern understanding of what a graphical computer interface should even be. So the work that they were doing in the early 1980s as they developed the Mac are still uh, echoing and reverberating throughout the world of technology today and probably will be for uh, a long time. So long story short, Andy Hertzfeld and Bill Atkinson started a project within Apple in the late 1980s. Um, they were working with a gentleman named Mark Porat and Mark Porat had convinced John Scully, who was at that time the CEO of Apple, he's probably better known as the guy that Steve Jobs had hired away from PepsiCo with that famous line, do you want to sell sugar water to kids for the rest of your life or do you want to come change the world? The guy he said that to was John Scully, who ended up not being the greatest CEO ever, but that's a different story. But Bill Atkinson, Andy Hertzfeld, Mark Porat, those three guys worked together to develop this concept of a next generation communications and lifestyle device, but they just weren't able to get a lot of traction within Apple to really devote a lot of attention or resources to this concept. Early in 1990, spring of 1990, they went to the CEO, John Scully, and had a conversation, and the long-term ramifications of that conversation were that their team ended up being spun off as a wholly new company, which they ended up calling General Magic. And they were joined at General Magic by some really influential people, uh, a couple of whom I think are worthy of, of uh, special recognition. Um, one would be Joanna Hoffman, who was the General Magic Vice President of Marketing. She is a tremendously important figure in the history of Apple as a company and the consumer technology industry. And along with her, there was also Susan Kerr, who uh, is also maybe the most influential person in history when it comes to defining how a modern you know, visually interactive computer will look and feel. Uh, Susan Kerr was the original designer of much of the iconography and visual interface of the original Macintosh. So the Happy Mac logo and every other icon you can think of associated with a vintage Mac, uh, Susan Kerr designed those by hand, along with a number of the fonts that the early Macs used. So it's really not a stretch to say that she had a direct founding influence on all of modern computer interfaces. So for both of those women to join Bill Atkinson and, uh, and the rest of the team at General Magic was really tremendous. And so I'll skip a lot of the rest of their history. You can read about it on Wikipedia or uh, some other places, but suffice to say General Magic as its own standalone company, they worked really hard to develop a new vision of a computer operating system that would be based on a completely visual and completely beginner friendly metaphor where everything would be centered around a visual concept of a home office which is a little different than a traditional computer desktop, they went in a very literal direction. Like literally the top of an office desk 
which you'll see in a moment when we look at this. But before we get that far, let's look at the hardware. Now, right away, you can see this device comes inside this sort of leatherette, almost hardback book looking case, which I'm about to open right now. And it's worth noting the name on this device, the, the manufacturer of this hardware was Sony. They licensed the operating system, which came to be known as Magic Cap. Uh, they licensed that from General Magic, the company that spun off from Apple. Sony named their device the Magic Link. Uh, Link in the name directly referring to the idea that Sony and General Magic really viewed this as a personal communications device. And again, consider that they're doing this in the early 1990s. There is no Wi-Fi. There is no Bluetooth. The internet is incredibly rudimentary. The World Wide Web is only just beginning to catch on. And if you've had any interaction with the internet in those days, it's probably through text-based services like BBSs or news groups. So this device was a decade or more ahead of its time in terms of what it was trying to be. But in any case, let's crack this open and take a look. So I'm gonna open this book and it opens like a book, but the device is meant to be used in landscape mode like this. And this soft case that you see attached to this thing, it's actually held on on the back with two snaps that you're seeing here. So I'm gonna unsnap this and take the device out of the soft case, like so. Ah, there we go. I always get nervous doing that. It feels a little sketchy. So I'm gonna set the soft case aside for now. So here we have the Magic Link itself. Oh, there's me, hi. And <laughs> the display on this thing is incredibly shiny. So I'm gonna do my best to keep my ceiling light and my own face out of the recording as much as I can. So bear with me on that. But looking at the face of it, we've got a large touch screen here, which I'll talk about again more in a moment. We've got two different option buttons. It almost feels like holding like, like a Wii U controller or something like that. Got a microphone right there. We've got this little icon. I'm gonna bring this up closer to my camera so you can see this. That's the icon of a tiny little rabbit popping out of a hat. And that is sort of the mascot or emblem of General Magic and their operating system, Magic Cap. Magic Cap referring to the hat that a rabbit would jump out of in a magician's trick. So that's sort of a running gag that you'll see all over the place with their stuff. Uh, nothing of any note on the front. On the right hand side, we've got a number of interesting things here. We've got a PC card slot, which I don't have anything installed in currently. There's a release switch for the PC card slot. We've got a contrast knob, power switch, a pen, and the battery compartment cover. And I don't always need to show this on every device, but I think this is kind of cool. This thing runs on six AAA batteries, which get loaded inside this sort of, almost like a, like a gun magazine, but that slides back in there. And then the little uh, cap goes back on the end. We've got the two snaps that you saw holding the uh, soft shell case on. We've got another hatch here for a backup battery. It takes a strange sort of barrel shaped like a half double A style battery, I think. I had one in here, but I noticed it was starting to leak acid. It's probably been in there for 20 years or longer. So probably not ideal to leave it in there any longer. So I took it out. Um, I also find it interesting. There is a stern warning here. Power your magic link using the AC adapter when replacing batteries. They're very concerned about data loss. And that makes sense. We've got FCC info and a serial number and so on. On the back, we've got a barrel style power plug, and also a built-in beam port. Uh, another, in other words, a uh, infrared transmitter port. And on the left side, we've got a telephone jack, and then a little drop-down hatch, which contains or hides two interesting ports. I'm not entirely sure what they are. They don't look like a standard port style or port configuration that I've come across before, so go figure. Um, the little trap door there says telecom and magic port. So I guess that's where you connect your magic. Huh, go figure. But again, consider this thing came out in, I think, 1993-ish, if I'm not off, plus or minus a year, I guess. And it had both a very early form of wireless communication with the infrared transmitter and wired communication with a built-in telephone line modem. And... From here, I'm going to try to turn this thing on, and I'm going to do it as best I can in a way that will 
try to minimize the glare on the screen. But again, this thing is incredibly shiny, so bear with me. Let's turn this on. And it beeps. It's alive. So we get the boot screen, Sony Magic Link. And then if I remember right, it's probably gonna ask us to help calibrate the touch screen. We'll give it a moment to finish booting the Magic Cap operating system here. I'm doing my best to hold it in place to keep the screen on. There we go. And it literally says, touch the screen to begin. And I can touch it with my finger, but I don't actually need to because you might remember on the side over here, there's a button labeled pen. And it's not actually a button, it's a spring-loaded release for a, drum roll please, a touch stylus. So it has its own stylus built in. It's got the very nice embossed Sony logo on it. So now I have something with which to touch the screen and not mush it up with fingerprints, which is kind of nice. And I gotta say, the contrast of the screen doesn't look awesome on camera. I'm gonna fiddle with the contrast knob over here and see if I can make it a little bit better. In person, it's actually quite nice. It's not a bad screen at all. Certainly for the era that it's from, I've seen way worse, way blurrier screens. I'm looking at you, game.com, you piece of crap. Anyways, that'll be a different video. So right now, I'm gonna say, touch the screen to begin. And then it says, touch the target's center to align the touch sensitive screen. So I'm just gonna do that right now. And I don't know if it was easy to tell, but the system actually makes some really pleasing little bleeps and bloops as you interact with it. And now it's letting me know that the backup battery is out of power or missing. We already looked up the empty hatch for that, so that's probably not a big surprise. So I'm gonna clear that. And then it tells me this is Magic Cap 1.0. And it's letting me know that I can touch the question mark in the upper left corner of the screen to show or hide messages like this one. And there's also a really nice built-in tutorial on how to use this device right here that I can trigger with this. So I'm gonna say, let's get started. And now it tells me that there are three steps involved in getting started with using the Magic Cap. Tap the word hallway in the corner to go to the hallway. And again, this whole thing is built on a, on a visual metaphor of a home office. So you can see behind this alert, there's a desktop with various icons we'll look at in a moment. I can come up here to go to the hallway, which will take us to other bigger options. We can go to a library from the desk to a library in the hallway. And here in the library, we can tap the getting started book. So the tutorial is literally teaching you a number of things all at once. It's teaching you how to interact with the touchscreen. It's familiarizing you with the hallway, which sort of serves as what we would think of as a home screen on a modern iOS or Android device. In the Magic Cap operating system, the hallway is where you choose which type of application or which type of task you want to complete. And by going into the library and opening the Getting Started book, I'm now effectively reading a very friendly little ebook explaining how to use this device. So it's just it's a really elegant, really clever way to interact with the device. So for here, I can change pages by tapping on the corners. There are interactive lessons about how to use the device, how to make the most of it. I can get to by tapping the corners. But for now, I'm gonna say, let's go back out to the library. There are additional books in the library that just come built into the system, along with a filing cabinet, which contains various other things. And from here also, I can go back out to the hallway and let's see what else we have here in the hallway. And again, I know the visuals aren't super easy to make out on camera, but trust me, it actually looks really nice. It's such a gentle, friendly way to interact with a computing device. Compare this to what would have been more common in the early 1990s, something like MS-DOS. I was talking earlier about how this was one of the first computers that I got to spend hands-on time with. In 1993, I would have been 10 or 11 years old, and having come from a background of having played a little bit with DOS or some earlier computers that used BASIC built into to the memory and things like that, this seemed like the future. And it's 
clearly not a device that caught on. If you've never heard of it before this, that's pretty, uh, pretty good evidence. But this concept of interacting with a device based on simple visual metaphors for the kinds of things you want to do, it was just so obviously better than anything else I had seen at the time. It really stuck with me. And here I am talking about this thing 25 years later, give or take. Uh, we can scroll a little bit further here. There's a storeroom. If we tap on that, we can see what's in the storeroom. Actually, I'm kind of curious. I don't know. Oh, it's letting me know. There's 417 kilobytes of main memory left available, and it'll tell me how much of the system's memory are being used up by things like my appointments calendar, note cards, and so on. Um, also, notice here, it's actually differentiating between received and sent mail, this device had a really robust, fully featured email client built in, which would have communicated using that built-in dial-up modem over here, or the infrared port on the back that we saw earlier. So again, just an incredibly elegant device. Let's come back out to the hallway. We've got a game room, which I, I'll admit when I was 11 was really the only thing I cared that much about. I absolutely loved, and I still love the whimsical touches in here, like the little clock with the swinging cat's tail. I actually knew people, uh, friends of ours, when I was a kid who had a Felix the Cat clock that looked just like this. If I tap on that, I think it brings something up. Yeah, there you go. It takes you to your des uh, desktop clock, world clock type uh, application. And then there are other little games like Solitaire, there's a mix and match the shapes type puzzle game. Make a guess. I have no idea what this does. I haven't put any time into this. I certainly don't remember how this worked. It sort of looks like Minesweeper, so maybe that's what this is. We can go back to the game room. This one with the Magic Cap logo on it is uh, a coin. I guess it'll just flip a coin for you. Again, just really fun and whimsical. Just a beautiful introduction to interacting with a computing device using only your fingers or stylus and only using visuals. We can come back out to the hallway, go further down the hallway, and we'll see some plaques on the wall here. If we go to the one with the Magic Cap logo on it, there we have all the credits. And I'm probably not going to be able to really show this too well, but if I zoom in a little bit, you can see all the credits for all the people who helped develop this device, including some of the names that I talked about earlier, which is kind of nice. I'll zoom out of that. And we can come back to the hallway. And I'm not sure what this directory does. Let's tap on that. Control desk, game room. Oh, it's just shortcuts. So that's clever. You don't even need to use the visual metaphor if you don't want to. You can jump straight to different areas like controls, which I think are like system preferences. So yeah, we could even turn the sound up, which is probably good. I don't think you guys are hearing much of this. Oh, how nice. We could even see or uh, sample the different sounds here. Those are fun, and they really remind me a lot of the sounds that you would find in an early Macintosh. Some of these are directly uh, reminiscent of things like Sosumi and Wild Eep, if those mean anything to you. Oh, and there are also instruments. I don't think I've ever seen this. That's cool. I don't know what you do with that, but it's neat. I don't know what the purpose of it is. Let's go back up to controls. We can set our signature, and that's actually pretty neat. You can sign your name on here. So I'm going to sign my name. Uh, yeah. There you go. Clear. That didn't come out so well. <laughs> it just vaporized itself. So it's just a fun, very clever system. You can always bring up an on-screen keyboard if you need one, which is kind of handy. Um, you can jump straight to the genie's lamp which is uh, shortcut commands, including things like find, a spell checker, beam for uh, communicating with another device using the infrared port, things like that. We can go straight to mail. Oh, there's nothing here to mail, so no big surprise. So that, I guess, is helpful. If you have something on screen that you could share with somebody, you can then directly mail it right from the genie's lamp. Uh, come back out to the hallway. Let's come back to the desk, which is sort of the, the default mode of interacting with this device. And 
I notice I have two items in my email inbox. Let's see what those are. And, oh, this is great. Let me zoom in, maybe you can see this. I've got two emails, one from AT&T, offering an opportunity to join personal link, and then a second email from America Online, requesting that we join America Online, which would make a lot of sense if it was still 1994, but it isn't, so I can't really do much with this. But again, really driving home the idea that this was a device for internet communications right at the dawn of the internet and I'm holding it in my hands and it's running off of six AAA batteries. So I'm not gonna draw this out anymore. I think for an introduction, this covers the main things that I figured anybody would wanna know. In any case, I'm just, I'm a big advocate for, not the device, obviously nobody's gonna use this in any you know meaningful sense today, but I don't think it deserves to be forgotten. The Magic Cap operating system, the Sony uh, Magic Link, and I think there was also a Motorola version that Magic, uh, excuse me, that General Magic licensed the operating system to as well. They're just, they're very clever, very innovative devices that in some ways were, were decades ahead of the curve in terms of understanding what people would want to do in a battery powered handheld device. And the just simple reality that it's a lot easier to do those things you'd want to do in a portable device if you have a really clean visual interface for doing them compared to typing in obscure DOS commands or something like that. So really cool device and a really clever and elegant operating system built into it. And that's it. I'm already running longer on this video than I planned to, but as you can probably tell, I'm just really impressed with this, this device. I'm gonna put a little bit more time into playing with it. And if I find any more interesting or clever things, I might make a follow-up video and I'll put that link in the show notes for this video if that ever happens. And that's it for now. Thank you for your time. I hope everybody's enjoyed their view at the Sony Magic Link and in reflection, me, Bye.